Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3? Daniel chapter 3. The book of Daniel is an easy book to find. Just close your Bible, open it up in the middle. It's going to be around Psalms or Proverbs. Go right. You'll see uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. This morning is about a story of three guys that you've probably heard about if you've been in Sunday school as a kid probably heard about all your life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fiery furnace. We're going to be talking about that story today. And there is one key point that I want you to grab hold of for this passage of Scripture, and that point is simply this. God will call upon you and upon me. He will call upon those who know him to stand for right even if it means that you have to stand alone. And even if it means that you have to stand at a great price. God is calling for you and I to stand for right. It begins in verse 1 by saying this, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps and prefects and governors and advisors and treasurers and judges and magistrates and all of the provincial officers to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. And then the herald loudly proclaimed, this is what you're commanded to do, O peoples and nations and men of every language, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Well, let's bow together for prayer. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word today, and we we thank you, Father, for your call in our life to stand for right, no matter what it costs, no matter if we have to stand alone. Teach us that truth today, and open our heart to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in a culture today in which there is a desire for Christians to stay silent. If we want to gather in our little churches and we want to have whatever religion we want to have, that's fine, but don't dare take the truths that we hear in the In the Bible, in church, don't you dare take it out into the rest of the world and live it out in your lifestyle, or you will pay a price. All my ministry, there have been moments in time in every church I've ever pastored in which I have made stands on moral issues in that church. And I have made stands not just in church, but in public venues when I felt that God was leading me to do it. Because I believe that that is part of the call of God for everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. But there have been many times in other churches that I've pastored in which I've made some stand on a moral issue and I get a communication back. It might be by letter. It might be by telephone call. Uh, It's oftentimes anonymous in which basically the communication that comes back to me is, Pastor, when it comes to politics, you need to mind your own business. You know what? I've thought about that, and I think there's some truth to that. I I think that when it comes to politics, that's not going to be a part of the platform of this church or Uh, churches that I've pastored, when it comes to to tax cuts and and bailouts and when it comes to bankrupting the United States of America's economy and when it comes to to, uh, mortgaging our kids' future, I don't really say 
much about all that. I don't really talk about that kind of stuff from the platform and other topics like that because I don't really think that's my place. And I also don't pretend to be an expert on all these things. I certainly have opinions, and privately I can express those kinds of opinions. But now when it comes to moral issues, I am minding my own business when I talk about them. All you got to do is go back to the Old Testament, and there's a section in the Old Testament called the prophets, the major and minor prophets. They're not major and minor because some are better than the others, it's simply because of the, the length of the books. The major prophets have the bigger books, the minor prophets, the smaller books, but each one of them were inspired infallible, inerrant words from God to us. And you read those prophets, and here's what you're going to discover. Every one of those prophets would stand in places of worship, and they would stand in public venues, and they would deal with moral issues, and they would deal with it straight and hard and tough directly, thus saith the Lord. And they didn't give apology for that. They would talk to the king about how immoral he was being, or they would talk to the society at large about how immoral it was being, and they would speak straight from the Word of God, and they never apologized for it. And sometimes they were arrested and thrown in prison, and sometimes they were killed, but they were never silent. Jesus Christ has said that you and I are light to the world and salt of the earth. Part of the properties of light is to expose darkness. Part of the properties of salt is to be a preservative. But if we are not light and we do not act like salt, we will lose that which is good and right and moral within our society. And that is not just a job for me as a pastor of this church. It is a job for every Christian in our everyday walk of life to stand for that which is right. We're going to get more and more opportunities to do that in our culture and in our society, and we must take those opportunities. We live in a society today that is in essence at war against the truths of the Word of God and Bible-believing churches. To not believe that is to put your head in the sand. For instance, a petition was filed in Minnesota a few years ago seeking to have the Bible removed from public school libraries. Gene Kasmar filed the petition, and here's what he said when he filed it. He said that the Bible is lewd, indecent, violent, and unsuitable for a wholesome learning environment. I'm amazed by that. For several years, our government has provided grants to the National Endowment for the Arts, but they have promoted obscene art, promoting sodomy and child pornography and attacks on the personhood of Jesus Christ as a regular venue. Jewish scholar Dr. Jacob Nosser, Nosner, a former member of the National Council of the Arts, which recommends NEA grants to artists, wrote this. He said, I think what is happening is that it is preferred to insult Christianity and offend Christians in the art world. This is a way of really making a name for yourself, being at once sensational and safe. It is pure exploitation. Nothing more, not even a sincere form of blasphemy. This is the culture in which we live. It is not considered hate speech to attack conservative Christians. It is considered appropriate. When was the last time that you ever saw an evangelical Christian or pastor cast in a positive light in any television show, in any movie? All of them are depicted in television and movies as char charlatans and mentally insane and frauds. Rob Reiner, who is a director of A Few Good Men, was quoted in the Los Angeles Times as saying, the moral majority kind of people are destroying our country. They get people twisted around with ideas of what morally should be. 
If they really believed anything, if they really believed in what they were preaching, if they really believed in what Jesus Christ said, they would not be promoting family values. I don't know where in the world this man's brain is. Universal Pictures has admitted that it constantly looks for scripts with anti-Christian themes. Cinecom Entertainment produced the movie, The Handmaid's Tale, a film about Christian fundamentalists who overthrow the government and throw unbelievers and minorities in work camps. But do you know what a Christian fundamentalist is in this culture? It is anybody who takes the Bible seriously and forms their morals and their life practices from it. And that is how we're depicted. Why is it that the world so despises conservative Christians? It has to do with its moral stance. It has to do with morality. It has to do with the stance that biblical Christians take on moral issues. And here's what I want to say to you. There will always be a price when God's people are willing to go against the flow. But it is a price that God has called us to pay. Daniel chapter 3 is about three men who went against the flow, three men who were willing to pay that price. And there are some principles that this passage of Scripture gives to us that you and I more than ever in this generation at this time have got to grab hold of. First of all, there will always be situations in which we are called to make a stand for Christ. Last Sunday, in Daniel chapter 2, we had the opportunity to, to see, to hear the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar and the interpretation of that dream. And you remember that the interpretation that Daniel gave of that dream is that Nebuchadnezzar had seen a great image. And Daniel said that great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw that had five sections in it, each one of those sections represented a kingdom that was to come. Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, that section of the image was the first kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon. But there would be five great kingdoms that would come. Four of those kingdoms, history tells us, have already come. But there is one kingdom that is yet to come, but it is a kingdom, I believe, that is emerging. Daniel gave the king that dream understanding of his dream, interpretation of his dream. And isn't it interesting that now the very next thing that we discover in the book of Daniel in chapter 3 is Nebuchadnezzar has built a great statue. You know what? I believe that he has built a great statue as a result of the interpretation of the dream in Daniel chapter Two about a great statue. I believe he's built this great statue to congratulate himself. This statue is 90 feet tall. It is nine feet wide. It is made out of gold. Nebuchadnezzar makes it, first of all, to give all of the people of Babylon the great opportunity to be able to worship him. He has got a wonderful heart. And then he does it so that he can develop unified people around one great religion. Remember, he has gone through nation after nation after nation, and he has conquered those nations. Each one of them had their own gods, and he allowed them to keep the gods that they had. He didn't care what gods they had. But he began to realize that after all of these people had been conquered, that there was a need to unify them. And one great way to unify them is to have one world religion, and that religion to be the worship of him. And so he creates this great statue. And he says to everybody, as soon as you see this statue and you hear the orchestra begin to play, I want you to bow down and worship me as God. Now, you can't force people to worship. Worship is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of, of the desire inside a person. But you can force a person to comply in kneeling down and at least pretending that they're worshiping this image. 
And Nebuchadnezzar says, I want everyone, as soon as you hear the music, I want you to bow down, and I want you at least to pretend that you are worshiping me. Now, he had a great incentive plan. It was called a fiery furnace. Everybody in that culture understood fire. And so when they heard what the problem was going to be for them and they didn't bow down and worship, they understood we've got to worship. Now, the beginning of the orchestra uh, uh, queued up. It began to play. And everybody just on cue bowed down and began to worship this image except three people within the earshot of that music. And that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All of our lives, we will watch people bow to the gods of our culture. And there will be pressure that is placed upon us for us to bow down and worship those gods as well. Jesus has said to every one of us, listen to his words in John 15, verse 20, remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You can take this to the bank. You can count on this in your life. God has called us to make a stand for truth in the name of Jesus Christ. But second of all, the Bible says that if we make a stand for Christ, we can know that our commitment will be tested. That's Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. For this reason, at that time, the Chaldeans, which is another name for the Babylonians, came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever, verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. All of us understand the power of neg negative peer pressure. It is such a tough thing to do to go against the flow. And all of us understand that. That is why it's so difficult for teenagers to stand alone against a culture that dresses sometimes inappropriately. That's why it is so difficult for adults sometimes to stand against the pressure of wrong business ethics. That is why it is so difficult to stand against those that are in a group and you are by yourself trying to stand for something that is right. It is difficult to stand against the flow. You've got to have the fortitude to be willing to stand alone for right. And parents, I want you to listen to me. This is why it is so crucial that as you are raising your children, that you are discipling your children, you are training your children, and in the midst of training them, you are teaching them how to stand alone for right for Jesus Christ. Because the day will come in which they will be required to. They must see you do it. They must see you give the example. That is why... You and I, as parents, cannot make decisions on the basis of, well, the other kids get to do it. Well, the other parents are allowing this to happen for their kids. It must be okay. Because the truth is, there's a whole lot of parents out there who don't want to take the time and don't have the interest in parenting their children right so you and I cannot take our cue from other parents. We've got to take our cue from what does God say. How does God say we are to raise our children? What does God say about the right decisions? And we've got to teach our children how to stand alone for right, no matter what. When Kathy and I were raising our sons, we were pretty strict. I think they would probably... There's no doubt in my mind they would say they were pretty strict. 
We were very strict about the movies that our children, our boys, would go watch. We knew what movies that they were going to go see, and they knew what movies that we would never approve of. We were strict about the kinds of friends that they would build their life with. We were strict about the places that they would go to spend the night. We were strict about the parties that they would attend. We were strict about our children because it was our responsibility as parents to care enough about our kids to do our dead level best to bring them up right to walk with God, to know God, to understand the truths about moral issues. But in our story, the problem that these three men are having is not about popularity. It's not about getting along with other people. It is about being fried. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have made the decision that they would allow God to decide for them how they would live and they would follow him with all their heart, no matter what it cost them. So the matter comes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego comes to the king's attention. And you can imagine he hit the ceiling. He brought them before him. He did the intimidation route, bringing these three young men before him to now call them in question for why they have made the decision that they have made. And he says to them, I'm going to give you another chance. And this time, you better do it right. Because if you don't do it right, you're going to pay the price. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this manner. You know what they're saying? We're not going to be politically correct. We don't even want to be. We're not going to be careful in our words. We're going to tell you straight out exactly what we're going to do and how we believe about this matter. Verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. What they're saying is, is that, king, we want you to understand that God is mightier than you that God is stronger than you, that he could snatch us out of your hand if he desired to, that he can rescue us and there is absolutely not one thing you can do to change it. Now, those are pretty bold words in front of a king that is the greatest, the most powerful man on the face of this earth. But then they said in verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve you, your gods, or worship the image of gold that you have set up. And here's what they're saying. God, the king, we want you to understand something. Even if God chooses not to rescue us, it's okay with us. We are willing to go to our death. That that's what it means to serve God and stay true to him. You know what? It takes a great amount of courage for them to say what they said in verse 17. God is able to snatch us out of your hand. We want you to know that. He is mightier than you, King Nebuchadnezzar. He is greater than you, and we're trusting him and obeying him. It took a lot of courage to say what they said in verse 17. I think it took more courage to say what they said in verse 18. Because even if God chooses not to, and we go to our death, King, we want you to know we're willing to die. If that's what it means, we're willing to die for what we believe in. The king is so impressed with what they say. He is amazed by their strength. He is so proud of them that he says, fellas, let's let these guys go. Not hardly. Here's a third principle that I want you to grab hold of. When we take a stand for Christ, we will pay the consequences. But I also want you to know that God will be by our side. Nebuchadnezzar goes ballistic. He goes crazy. He demands that the furnace be heated up seven times hotter than it has ever been heated up before. He, he has the strongest men grab these three guys and bind them so that they are bound so tight they cannot possibly be free. 
and they are thrown into the fiery furnace. And in fact, so hot is the furnace that the men who throw them into the furnace die simply because of the blaze. And when these three men are thrown into the furnace, every one of them immediately go to be with God in heaven. They die immediately. And you know what? Praise God for these three guys. Praise God that these three guys were willing to die for the cause of truth in their life. In fact, what we ought to do is we ought to pause for just a moment and just sort of have a moment of silence remembering these three men. Well, not quite. The Bible says that when these three men were thrown into the fiery furnace, that Shadrach, when he hit the floor of the furnace, looked over and he said, Meshach, are you okay? Meshach said, I can't believe it, but I'm okay. Abednego, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine too. All three of these guys were preserved by God in the midst of this furnace as a testimony of the power and the strength of God. But notice what happens in verse 24. Nebuchadnezzar looks inside the furnace. He wants to see these three guys charbroiled. But notice what happens. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar then asks, wait a minute, didn't we throw these three men in? Yes, comes the reply. Look again, he says. I see four men loose walking in the furnace, and wait, the fourth man looks like the Son of God. Do I hear an amen this morning? I believe that Jesus Christ himself 450 years before Bethlehem, left the throne, his throne in heaven, and he went down to this fiery furnace to look these three men in the eyes and say to them, well done, good and faithful servants. And by the way, I'm not finished with you yet. This is not dying day. When Nebuchadnezzar sees these four men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Jesus Christ walking around in that fiery furnace. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar in verse 28 then says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. In other words, he's becoming very political at this moment. If you can't beat them, join them, right? All of a sudden, he realizes, uh uh-oh. And suddenly, he's going to praise God. They trusted in God and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. In other words, he is saying, "Uh, uh uh-oh, I'm in big trouble. He totally changed his tune. He welcomed these three men, and he gave honor, even reluctantly, to the God of heaven. Now, I want you to take a look at this story that is more than a story. It is a true account of something that literally happened. I want you to take a a, a look at what God teaches us in this story. I want you to hear this truth. This world is going to keep pushing you. This world is going to keep pushing anybody and everybody that dares to take the Word of God and say, this Bible is my manual. This Bible tells me what God says is right or wrong, and based upon what God says, I now say it. You see, we live in a world that does not know what right or wrong is. We live in a world of relativity. Uh, a a kind of a relative kind of truth. It's whatever you think it is. It's whatever society says it is. But there is no absolute right and wrong. But the truth is there is a God in heaven. And that God has said to us, there is a right and wrong. And I am the judge and I'm the one that will determine it. And every person that lives in this life will one day stand before a holy and righteous God and we will give account of our life to exactly how it was that we lived and the stands that we made 
and the truth by which we lived or the lie by which we lived. One day, God will rescue you if you are willing to walk with him. But to rescue us does not necessarily mean painless. Isaiah was killed because of his stand for God. Jeremiah was imprisoned because of his stand for God. Peter was crucified upside down because of his stand for God. There have been millions of Christians, not just in the first century and second century and third century, but through all these centuries and even today. More people are under persecution for the cause of Jesus Christ today in countries around the world than at any other time in human history. Men and women and teenagers and children who are being persecuted today because of their stand for Jesus Christ. There have been millions of people throughout all of these last 2,000 years who have lost their jobs, who have lost their homes, who have lost their families, who have lost their lives because they stood for Jesus Christ. And I wish you could hear the testimonies men and women, teenagers in the early church all the way through who counted it a privilege to be humiliated for the cause of Jesus Christ, to lose all that they had for the cause of Jesus Christ, who counted it a privilege to be able to suffer for the name of Jesus. God has called you and I to make stands. Where we work where we go to school, in the PTA, in places that we encounter, he has called you and I to make a stand for him. And this morning, I'm challenging you to be willing to say, I will make the stand that God leads me to make for that which is right. I will not stand by and be quiet when my Lord's name and his word is being abused. I will stand for him. And God makes a promise to us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. This morning I want to challenge some of that are in this room that have never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Never committed your heart by faith to Christ. This morning we want to have what we call an invitation, inviting you to come and make a decision. You know what? Even if it means i got to stand against the flow, I want to know the God that made me. I want to have a relationship with the God that loves me. I want to have a life that lives for something that is greater than me. This morning, we want to invite you to come and receive Jesus Christ as Savior. There's some of you who may be sitting there and the truth is when you were a little kid you walked down some aisle and maybe you were baptized in some baptistry but the truth is in your heart of hearts you know that you never truly honestly received Jesus Christ as your Savior you never committed your heart by faith to him God is coming to you today and saying I'm real and I'm here and I love you And I want to know you and you know me. And I want to have a relationship with you. This morning I'm calling to your heart. Would you commit your heart by faith to me? This morning I want to invite you to come and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. For some of you who are visiting this church this morning, God's speaking to your heart and saying to you, this is the place I want you to be. Maybe this is the first time you've come, or maybe you've come many times before. But this is the place, this is the time, and God is calling you to become a part of Sugar Creek, and we want to invite you to make that decision. Now, some of you are saying in your heart of hearts, what I need to do is I need to walk down this aisle. I know Christ is my Savior. I'm a member of this church, but I need to get on my knees. I need to ask God to give me the strength and the courage to be the man of God, the woman of God a teenager of God that God is calling me to be. 
This morning, we invite you to come and make that decision for Christ. The Bible says that all of us are lost, and none of us can save ourselves. Jesus Christ came from heaven, and he took on a body, and he lived a perfect life, and he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, and he rose again from the grave, and he offers to us the gift of eternal life, and he says that by faith, you will commit your heart to Jesus Christ. He'll come into your heart and save you and forgive you and cleanse you, and he'll make you a brand new person. Does it mean that I will never sin again? No. Does it mean that all my problems will go away? No. But it does mean that the God of heaven has come to live inside of you, to give you the strength and the power to take the next step in your life. And he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he is calling you to himself. And would you come this morning and make that decision?